All right, welcome back to our Wednesday night New Testament study here. We're in Luke chapter 1. We worked our way through 38 verses last week. I think there's 84, so we split it in half here. 80, there's 80 verses. So we're picking up at verse 39. Just to recap a little bit, what we saw last week was the angel Gabriel had come and he had appeared to Mary and told her that uh, she was going to um, bring forth the Messiah and call his name Jesus because he would save people from their sins. And she said, how can this be that I've never known a man? He said, don't worry about it. God's got it. God's going to handle it. That holy thing that's conceived within you is, is the work of God. And then the Gabriel angel also went and appeared to Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, who were the mother and the father of John the Baptist, and told them that they were going to conceive, even though Elizabeth was in her old age, and uh, God's going to do a miracle for you too, and he's going to be in the spirit and power of Elijah, be the forerunner of the Messiah. That's where we're picking back up here in verse 39 tonight. So Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Ju Judah, verse 40, and entered into the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Now Elizabeth, we found out, was Mary's cousin. So she goes to spend time with uh, her cousin and her cousin's husband, Zacharias. Remember, Zacharias still can't talk. Mm -hmm. He was struck dumb when he doubted the angel, and uh, that's going to get fixed. Hang on here in a minute, though. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, both of them pregnant now, Elizabeth, I think about three months ahead of Mary, or, or maybe six months ahead of her, that the babe leaped in her womb. So, John the Baptist leaped in the womb when Elizabeth, his mama, heard the greeting of her cousin, the mother of the Messiah, Mary out here. And I can't go past that and say, that's a baby in that womb. <laughs> it leaped in the womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost when that had, the child leaped and she was filled with the Holy Ghost. And then Elizabeth, I think what she did after being filled with the Holy Ghost here, she prophesied. She spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou, Mary, among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Mary is carrying the Lord Jesus inside of her, and Elizabeth already recognizes what's going on here. For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation, your greeting, sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believes. This is Elizabeth still talking to Mary. Blessed are you for believing this, Mary. And blessed is she that believes. I like to take that and say, you know what? Blessed is he or she that believes the gospel today too, ain't it? Blessed is she that believes, for there'll be a performance. God will do those things which were told from the Lord. He'll perform the things he tells us in this book too. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. And this is Mary's song here now, the Magnificent. And my spirit's rejoiced in God, my Savior. A, I think Pam used to sing this sometime at Christmas. Mary, did you know, right? Now it's got a great profound line and it. it said, Mary, did you know that the baby you'll deliver would one day deliver you? on the cross of Calvary. So she said, my spirits rejoiced in God, my Savior. And here's really a kind of a picture that we've already got of the Trinity here, even though the church hasn't used that term this early on, but we're seeing the Trinity right here. You've got the Lord Jesus, God the Son in Mary's belly. You've got God the Father in heaven, but you've got God the spirit who's working on the earth when the Holy Spirit moves upon Elizabeth and she rejoices and prophesies. So there's a triune God right there. For he's regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. That's Mary in her song, right? From, from this gener from everybody from now on will call me blessed. She said, because she's going to bring the Savior into the world, the chosen of God. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things. God, and holy is his name. Holy is a church word, and here's literally what it means. It is the complete and total opposite of sinful. God is holy. 
Holy is his name, the name of God. And his name is holy too. Verse 50, and his mercy is on them that fear him. So we're, God's holy and we're not. We need his mercy. That's what the story of Jesus is about, how God was able to extend his mercy to fallen sinners, but it took his son, it took God coming in the person of a human being, a sinless human being that lived a sinless life, that could be the substitute for the rest of us sinners and take the wrath of God upon himself. That's, that's the gospel. That's the story of Jesus. The, he was born with a mission to go to the cross for us on our behalf. 51. He, being God again, Mary's song still gone, he showed strength with his arm. That's one of those technical terms that's anthropomorphism, the signing human qualities to God. God, as, as the Bible says, the, the Heavenly Father, He's a spirit. He's an invisible God and He's a spirit. Those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and the truth. And the only body He's got is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they can say His church is the body of Christ too. But it's just like when the Bible assigns human qualities to them, we understand their anthropomorphisms. Like the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout all the earth. We don't believe there's literally some eyeballs running around, but God sees everything. So when it talks about his, his arm, and usually it says his right arm, symbol of strength, he scattered the proud in their imagination of their hearts. 52, he's put down the mighty from their seats. And God exalts them of low degree. James says that years later over here in the end of the New Testament. said, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. God exalts those that will humble, humble themselves. He's filled the hungry with good things. And I don't know if Mary meant that figuratively, literally, or spiritually, but I can apply it spiritually, and I can say, you know, when I got saved, God made me hungry for spiritual truth, and I've spent my life trying to fill myself with it and finding more and more, and I'm still hungry, and he's filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he sent away, sent empty away, and the rich here in the song, I believe, is uh, the way of saying the people who don't see that they have any need for any help. They don't have any need for God, and they're going to go away empty. you got to be hungry, don't you? And he that's helping his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And remember, uh, we're studying Genesis on Sunday night in our Old Testament class. We've just got through the story of Abraham. We've moved into Isaac and about to make our way into Jacob now. But God began with that one man, Abraham. Abraham was the first Hebrew, if you would. God called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. He became a pilgrim, a Hebrew. And God met with him time and time again in Abraham's life. And he reiterated the same promise to him over and over and over again. said, Abraham, if you can count the stars in the heaven, I'm going to give you descendants like that. If you can count the sand on the beach, I'm going to give you descendants like that. And it's the Abrahamic covenant. And he says, and Abraham said, all the nations of the earth is going to be blessed in you and your descendants. Your, your seed, it's the descendant singular, Paul points out. Because the way all human beings, all nations of the earth can still be blessed through Abraham is that it was through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and on down through the line there, Judah, I guess it was, and on down through history that the Messiah finally came. He was a descendant of Abraham. New Testament says every believer is a descendant of Abraham too. We're the children of the promise by faith, not biologically. But Mary can say all the families of the earth be blessed through her because she's in the line of Abraham now and she's carrying the Messiah. Next verse even tells what I said. He spake to our fathers, to Abraham. He remembered that mercy, remember that covenant. And he spake to our forefathers, to Abraham and to his seed, singular again, forever. And Mary abode with her about three months. She stayed with Elizabeth there three months. End of the song here. And then she returned to her own house. Now, Elizabeth's full time to be delivered came. We'd say she was nine months and it was time. And she brought forth a son, John the Baptist. And her neighbors 
And her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. Now, anybody that's anybody rejoices when they've got a friend that brings a new child into the world, right? But anybody that's anybody rejoices when a new Christian comes into the world too, right? When somebody's born again, everybody rejoices. All Christians do anyway. But John the Baptist is born, and the little baby's there, and all the neighbors are excited, you know, because here's old Elizabeth. She's past age, and now she's, she's been given this miracle baby. And it came to pass that on the eighth day, which was what the law said, you took a little boy on the eighth day to give him the sign of his being born in the covenant people of God, which was circumcision in the Old Testament. It's baptism in the New Testament, the sign of the covenant people of God. And it came to pass on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zacharias. They, they was going to name him Zacharias after his daddy, Zacharias Jr., if you want. And his mother answered and said, Not so. You ain't naming my baby Zacharias. I've got one of them. He's enough, right? <laughs> well, he'll be called John. And they said to her, there's, there's, none, there's nobody in your family named John. None, none of your kindred called by that name. And verse 62 to me is really especially interesting because it says they made signs to his father how he would have him called. Now, the Bible tells us that when he doubted angel Gabriel, he was put under a temporary judgment that he was dumb and he could not speak. But it looks to me like he might have been struck deaf here too because they made signs to ask him, what do you want this baby called? And he asked for a writing table or tablet. We'd say something to write on. He's going to write down what he wants his son named. And he wants it named what that angel said. <laughs> Saying his name is John. And they marveled all. And his mouth was opened. <laughs> Immediately. And his tongue was loosed. And guess what he did? He started praising God. <laughs> He's been over nine months, couldn't speak here. He praised God, and fear came all that dwelt round about them, and all these sayings were noised abroad. It made the news throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And, the, and his father, John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, like I think, John's mother already has here. And he prophesied and said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Now, God's people were not redeemed in John the Baptist. God's people are going to be redeemed in the Messiah, Jesus, when he goes to the cross. And he's raised up a horn of salvation for him. John's not talking about his boy. <laughs> he's talking about the Messiah, Jesus, ain't he? Of, the, of his servant, uh, in the house of his servant David, or in the line of King David, who came through Abraham's line. And he spake, and he, this is Zechariah still going on praising the Lord, said, God's done what he said he'd do. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, that's these we got in the Bible, and maybe others too, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Now, spiritually speaking, through Jesus, we're saved from our enemies of sin, death, hell, and the grave. And all that hate us, we're saved from the devil. He hates us <laughs> and his demons. And God did it to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant that he began making with Abraham, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us Zechariah still going on here, that we be, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Boy, that's a Christian message for the New Testament church, ain't that we're saved to serve. Serve him in holiness and righteousness before him. We've been cleansed of our sins so we can walk in holiness and righteousness. And if the cleansing on the outside is going to show up in your lifestyle too in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, now Zechariah, I think, talking to his boy now. Thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. John the Baptist is going to be a prophet of God. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord Jesus, we know, 
to prepare his ways. He's the messenger, the preparer for the Lord. And his job is going to be to give knowledge of salvation. And, and just as John the Baptist grows up and tells the folks back in the Bible, says now, said I, you know, John writing his gospel says that uh, he's not that light. And John the Baptist said, I, I ain't either. Said, uh, I'm not worthy to uh, untie his shoes, to put it in contemporary terms. And when he sees Jesus, John the Baptist, I always like in John, the first one, John the Baptist has got some disciples already. They're following him around in chapter 1 of John. And when they meet the Messiah, John's trained, tra trained them right. They leave John the Baptist and they begin following Jesus. John the Baptist's job was to tell people that I'm one that's just baptizing with water. I just do a symbolic baptism. He's still doing the real baptism with fire and the Holy Ghost. When John the Baptist sees Jesus in their grown-up state out there on the Jordan River, it's John the Baptist that says he's the sacrifice for sin. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So John's job is to give knowledge, verse 77, of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. Or really, John the Baptist was... the his commission is the same commission as preachers today should be, that our job is to preach the cross of Christ to people. And we preach that cross that it's through, we give the knowledge of salvation and people do what they want with, hope they do the right thing. And it's through the knowledge of salvation of the cross and the empty tomb that you can have the remission, the erasing of your sins, if you want to put it that way. Through the tender mercy of our God and, and every Christian that's ever been saved, the only reason we're saved is because God was merciful to us. It's through his tender mercy and the cross of Christ that we're saved. Nobody ever deserved it. It's grace. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us. A name for God, I think. To give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And today we can put the Bible right in there too, that the Bible gives light to those who sit in darkness and to guide our feet into the way of peace because the Bible points us to Christ. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit. This is John the Baptist because I, I know from the last part. And he was in the deserts, the wilderness, till the day of his showing unto Israel. We'll pick up next there, next week, chapter 2, and believe it or not, it's almost Easter and it's middle of March, but it's going to be Christmas next week, Luke chapter 2. See you next week.